Uh, let's get going. It's uh, a Midsummer Friday evening. Uh, welcome to you all. My name is Tony Travers. I'm uh, Associate Dean of the School of Public Policy. Uh, I'm standing in for Anders Velasco, our Dean, who unfortunately can't be with us this evening because I'm indisposed. But it's a great event, uh, and I'm glad to see the room absolutely packed and people waiting outside. Uh, I'm very pleased to welcome here the Honourable Kevin Rudd uh, once again, and welcome both you in the room and our online audience. Uh, Kevin Rudd is President and CEO of Asia Society and has been President of the Asia Society Policy Institute since January 2015. He served as Australia's 26th Prime Minister from 2007 to 2010, that is its Foreign Minister from 2010 to 2012, before returning as Prime Minister to be Prime Minister in 2013. He's a graduate of the Australian National University with honours in Chinese studies and is fluent in Mandarin and has also studied at the National Taiwan Normal University in Taipei. Now, the reason for this evening's event, as you all know, is that uh, Kevin Rudd has written a book whose title is The Avoidable War, The Dangers of a Catastrophic Conflict Between the US and Xi Jinping's China. And I don't really need to say a lot more than that, save that clearly we live in a, a, a world in which China is emerging as an industrial and defence and diplomatic superpower. We have a differently or had a differently polarised world in the past, some of which is definitely still with us and under stress as we speak. And I think what this book uh, will elegantly help us with is understand how the US and China, as the world's superpowers in future, are to relate to each other and through an understanding of China, how it's possible uh, to avoid the risk of um, an accidental or inadvertent conflict. <laughs> anyway, I don't say any more than that. I'm going to invite our guest, uh, Kevin Rudd, to speak about his book and um, to warm to the theme of the evening. And after I should say, what uh, I'm going uh, <laughs> to say, we'll have a brief discussion here. Then you can ask questions, make comments short, I hope. And then at the end of the event, just after seven, there will be an opportunity, should you so wish, to buy a copy of the book and have it signed by the author. Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin Rudd. Can I say <laughs> Well, uh, good evening, one and all. Uh, my central question for each and every one of you is, it's Friday night. It's nice out there. Why aren't you all at the pub? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> uh, so um, uh, anyway, for all of your uh, level of uh, uh, academic nerdiness uh, for wanting to be here in this uh, seminar this evening, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate your um, interest in the world of policy and the world of ideas. It's good to be back at the LSC. I've been here quite a number of times over the years. Uh, and uh, it's a great place for each and every one of you to study. So why have I written this book? Have you got a copy of my book there? Thank you. Here it is. I'm now in the retail business. <laughs> okay. The, um, I've called it the avoidable war. Uh, the dangers of a catastrophic conflict between the US and Xi Jinping's China. So let me just make some introductory remarks about uh, why I've written this book. I don't write books for fun, um, for the simple reason that I've got lots of other things to do. But as someone who's been actively engaged in uh, the analysis of China and diplomacy in dealing with China for the better part of the last 35 years, uh, I've suddenly become quite anxious about where things have got to. And there are two or three reasons for that. Uh, one uh, is whether we like it or not, the relationship between the United States and China today is one of strategic competition. Chinese may use that term or may not. The Americans, depending on which administration, may use that term or may not. But the reality is it's on. It's deeply competitive. And at all levels of the relationship, it's a military competition, there's an economic competition, there's a technological competition. And... Uh, there is a prize for who wins the competition. 
And the prize for who wins the competition is that which of these two players emerges as the dominant power, both regionally and in time, globally. Now, this will not be stated explicitly by either government or by either of the uh, sets of political parties, uh, Communist Party or the Republican slash Democrat Party, but that's actually what's underway. There's a second reason uh, why um, I've become concerned uh, is that the balance of power between the two competitors is changing radically and rapidly. And as a consequence, behaviors are changing as well. Uh, if I was to look back 20 or 30 years and ask myself the question, what's the balance of military power in the Taiwan Straits between the armed forces of the United States uh, and those of the People's Republic of China, it would have been a relatively uh, comfortable assessment to conclude the preponderance of power lay with the Americans. Uh, 20 years later, that is no longer the case. In fact, as Wellington said after Waterloo, it's a near run thing. Um, and if you look at the particular categories of weapon systems, both land-based, sea-based and air-based, the equation is at one analysis tight and on another analysis now favoring China. And for those reasons, the strategic behaviors and political behaviors of both sides are changing as well. There's a third reason why um, we are now in a state of uh, acute competition. And that's because uh, Xi Jinping as a leader is quite different to his predecessors. Um, I have in my diplomatic and political career met and been with Deng Xiaoping, Zhao Ziyang, Hu Yaobang, Jiang Zemin, uh, and, uh, and uh, Hu Jintao, as well as Xi Dada. Uh, and this guy is different, quite different. Um, he's different in many respects, but uh, not least of which is his predisposition to take calculated strategic risks in order to change the status quo and to advance China's interests and values in the region and the world. If you like, the, uh, the very simple lay summary of that change could be found in the language used in the party's uh, conference on neighboring states diplomacy, the uh, back in uh, 2013, and also in the Zhongyang Weijiao uh, uh, in 2014, where Deng Xiaoping's traditional axiom of hide your strength, bide your time, never take the lead, was replaced by a new period of striving for achievement, fun fire your way. And China as a Marxist-Leninist uh, party uh, and state does not change its language, its ideological language casually. Words matter within the ideological frameworks of the Chinese Communist Party. And when language changes, reality changes as well. And so what you look at underneath these uh, changes uh, in uh, the way in which China describes its posture under Xi Jinping's leadership, it is then palpably felt by countries around the world, neighboring states, those in the wider Indo-Pacific region and globally, as China has become, based on its increased national power, uh, more assertive in the prosecution of its foreign security policy interests. If there's a final factor at play in all this is that Uncle Sam, any Americans here tonight? Welcome. The, um, the, um, how many Chinese are here tonight from the PRC? <laughs> okay, you're in the minority, my friend. The, uh, and how many of you are from neutrals? Just the rest of the world. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's interesting. Is that Uncle Sam and the United States has chosen to respond? And it has. And both under the Republicans, uh, under the idiot Trump, uh, in uh, the uh, national security strategy of November 2017, uh, brought down by H.R. McMaster, the national security advisor, who is highly professional, unlike his idiot boss. Um, and that national security strategy for the first time defined the relationship with China as one of strategic competition. And once uh, Trump lost to the Democrats in the 2020 presidential election, the Democrats, though not using this uh, expression explicitly, have essentially retained that framework uh, 
uh, for their uh, relationship with the People's Republic of China. The difference with the Democrats, it is now more systematic than could ever have been possible with the chaotic nature of Donald Trump's cerebral cortex. These are therefore the driving factors. The fact that we have a change in the balance of power, a change in China's leadership, and a American strategic response uh, to China's change in power and posture. So that's the reality. So therefore, why the book? I could just sit down there and describe all this and say we should all go and slit our wrists and go away. Um, but no, uh, I'm an eternal optimist because I'm an Australian. How many Australians are here, by the way? Okay, you're in the, major you're in the majority for the one and only time, guys. <laughs> by the way, the Australians, because they love to drink, they'll be buying you all a free drink later on. <laughs> it's a bit like this. Given that we are, therefore, in this age of strategic competition, uh, there are, in my judgment right now, for the decade ahead, what I call the decade of living dangerously, two sets of strategic alternatives for both Beijing and Washington. One is we continue what we have at present, which is what I call unmanaged strategic competition. No rules of the road, no guardrails, no nothing. A rolling game of push and shove, uh, either in the uh, Taiwan Straits, uh, in the South China Sea, in the East China Sea, uh, a bit of activity in and around the Korean Peninsula, and certainly in cyber and space, and of course, there's the Sino-Indian border as well. The problem with push and shove uh, in geopolitics uh, is that it become very sharp indeed, and it's inherently unpredictable. You never know when you push too hard, and you never know when the other person pushes back too hard. And as a consequence, what we now have is a series of incremental steps re-establishing equilibrium in the midst of a game of push and shove. Now, this is not um, sort of an abstraction. Two weeks ago, Chinese uh, Air Force intercepted an Australian Air Force reconnaissance aircraft over the South China Sea. Intercepted, that's normal. That's what often happens. What's unusual was that the Chinese intercept aircraft then released a great trail of chaff, which is uh, material usually designed to be released uh, in order to deflect from an incoming missile attack and instead release that chaff into the engines of the Australian aircraft. Nearly stalled it, and that would mean down with, by the plane. Um, but leaving aside your concern for the future and fate of an Australian reconnaissance aircraft in the South China Sea is this. Had that happened, the terms of the Australian Bilateral Security Treaty with the United States would immediately have been triggered. The ANZUS Treaty between the United States and Australia, uh, analogous to what happens between the treaty partners, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, is as follows. An attack on the armed forces of either of the contracting parties, US or Australia, in the Pacific area shall cause the contracting parties to consult in order to meet the common danger. It's the triggering clause for military action. So we are now at quite a dangerous juncture. This has not just happened with Australian aircraft, it's happened with other aircraft as well. I'm leaving to one side here who's right and wrong. I'm simply being descriptive and analytical. So therefore, that's the reality we are in today. On any given day of the week, there are dozens of Chinese aircraft deployed into Taiwan's air defense identification zone, it's ABIS. There are many aircraft and many more ships deployed in and around disputed uh, land features and maritime uh, claims in the South China Sea, including multiple uh, Chinese uh, customs vessels, Chinese coast guard vessels, Chinese fishing fleets, uh, all engaged in coordinated activities to continue to assert China's territorial claims. But there are countermeasures as well. Similarly, in the East China Sea, where America's principal treaty ally in the region, Japan, uh, is in the business of uh, responding to uh, Chinese air and naval and uh, other maritime activity in and around the disputed territories of Senkoku Diaoyudao in the East China Sea. So my simple proposition is there's a lot of metal flying around or sailing around. And on the law of averages, metal 
sooner or later tends to run into metal. And at that point, you have an incident. And if you're a student of international relations, incidents have a predisposition to escalate. They have a predisposition to produce crisis. They have a predisposition then to produce conflict. And that in turn has a predisposition or a possibility or probability of creating war. If you think that's all remote, go back, have a look at the history of the First World War and how that began. If you read the newspapers of uh, 1914 and conducted a poll in any country in the world as to who the hell Archduke Ferdinand was, no one could have answered you. Yet after the assassination of the Austrian Archduke um, in the end of June of 1914, the monumental failure of diplomacy during July of 1914, resulting in the guns of August of August 1914, was by definition an unavoidable, sorry, was by definition an avoidable war, except we failed. And so therefore, I become quite anxious about our current set of circumstances, relying upon unmanaged strategic competition, no guardrails, no rules of the road, push and shove, and let's just hope that it's all okay in the morning. The alternative I outline in this book is called managed strategic competition. This is not an idealistic uh, concept. I'm not into the international school of Kumbaya and global handholding um, um, because by and large in geopolitics, it doesn't work. It's a realist proposition, which is it accepts the reality that this competition's underway and the stakes are very high. But it also rests on the assumption that neither side of this stage is predisposed towards fighting a conflict. And there's a reason for that is because neither side is ready yet to fight a conflict. And neither side is absolutely confident that they would prevail in such a conflict. So under those circumstances, how do you reduce the risk of accidental conflict? And that's what this is about manage strategic competition. There are three simple principles involved, and I'll conclude on that and let's go to a discussion. One is around the identifiable set of strategic um, red lines, Taiwan Straits, South China Sea, East China Sea, Korean Peninsula, and cyber and space, which is a domain not visible to us, but one which is now of fundamental relevance to stability that in each of these areas, it is better for each side to articulate through private high-level diplomacy to the other side, what each side's strategic irreducible red lines are. You'll never achieve agreement on it. The other side will not say, well, look, I've been wrong all along. By God, you've been right. I accept that. It's not going to work that way. But it's far better to have knowledge of what constitutes such a red line because you will then know that if you cross that red line, a retaliatory action will ensue of one form or another. At present, that's an ambiguous proposition. And therefore, I believe on balance, given where we are at present, it is more stabilizing than the current reality. The second element of, of managed strategic competition is this, that if you can engineer the first, <clears throat> that for other dimensions of the relationship, the rest of security policy, the totality of foreign policy, economic policy, trade, investment, as well as technology, as well as capital markets, currency markets, talent markets, and the great contest of ideas, uh, the US uh, liberal international order versus China's alternative for it and the underpinning ideological constructs associated with it in terms of Marxism-Leninism, authoritarian capitalism, however you choose to describe it. And what I say in the book is, may the best system win. Now, I'm a freedom guy. I know who I'd be backing, but I'm all for an open competition in the wonderful world of ideas, as I am in these other areas of non-lethal strategic competition. And the final element of the equation is that within a framework of, of a managed strategic competition, there can still be sufficient political and diplomatic space crafted between these two great powers in order to provide an opportunity for strategic collaboration and cooperation in global public goods in areas which are of fundamental national interest to each of them. Climate change falls within that category because it represents ultimately an existential threat to both of them. Look at the extreme weather events in China, 
look at the fact that this year's harvest in China is appalling. And the reason it is, is because you've had massively unseasonable weather. Look at the United States and look at the increasing tempo and intensity of unseasonal weather events there, and so it is across the world. Global financial stability. Look at how much global debt markets are burdened at present. China has a debt to GDP ratio of something in the order of 314% of GDP, though most of it is domestically, not internationally denominated, but there are fundamental financial instabilities within the Chinese system. The global financial system in terms of the public indebtedness and corporate indebtedness and personal indebtedness is also huge. Uh, I am a survivor with lots of scar tissue of the global financial crisis. I was prime minister during that mess. I know what it was like and I know what, how, what a near run thing it was to prevent the world from plummeting into a second depression. And collectively, we managed to prevent that. The 20 governments that made up the G20 through combined and concerted and collaborative action. So maintaining global financial stability is not just a nice set of phrases, it's a reality. It's a day-to-day -day reality of the Financial Stability Board, the Basel Committee and those associated with it. And finally, the next pandemic, whatever it, shape or form it takes, given how collectively we totally screwed up the management of the last one. Um, and therefore, there is a lesson learned there in terms of the common enemy of us all. That's managed strategic competition uh, as opposed to unmanaged strategic competition. That's the burden of the book. I've now sent copies to Washington and Beijing. I've handed it over to various people personally, uh, the Secretary of State, the National Security Advisor, those in the Pentagon. And because I can't go to China because I refuse to spend three weeks in a Beijing hotel locked up, <laughs> I have nonetheless sent copies to counterparts in the Chinese system as well, where it's now being translated uh, into Chinese and published there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Just before we get going, is, if this is being live streamed, are the people watching on the live stream got that in the middle of their screen, just to be sure you didn't got rid of that? Chopping the speaker in half? Perhaps it doesn't matter. Really? Thank you. <laughs> okay. Quite used to being chopped in half. Well, yes. <laughs> Politics, really. Now, as you were speaking, and you mentioned um, the outbreak of the First World War, but I also remember hearing Robert McNamara, Robert McNamara, I think the American Defence Secretary at the time of the Bay of Pigs, commenting that as they sat um, in the Pentagon in the White House at the time, nobody thought through in detail what life was like in the Kremlin for Khrushchev in real time, the internal politics of the, of the Kremlin. And so the point you're making looks, sounds to me as if it's sort of recurring problem in international relations. And that being the case, um, I mean, the world, Australia, the United States, China, other countries, Britain, the EU, pay for diplomats. They have extensive diplomatic calls around the world who one might have hoped would be on top of these kind of issues. They'd be providing information back to their home base. They'd have spies telling them things. And yet, the implication... Only, of only the point, British have spies. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> the implication of this is that, that your book effectively implies that that's not quite doing it, so that that doesn't quite deliver the goods for Washington, Beijing, other capitals. Is that right? Uh, conventional diplomacy isn't quite doing it. That's correct, because what we're facing at the moment is structural and systemic. It's not individual and episodic. And when in the course of human history you have structural and systemic change, or the immediate prospect of it, it actually requires the engagement directly of the political principles and the heads of government in order to either ride along with the course of history or to choose to change it. It's not therefore simply the task of day-to-day -day routine diplomacy. Um, when you're looking at, for example, uh, a set of circumstances which would be as follows, that even when China becomes the world's largest economy, measures GDP and market exchange rates, that that would be the first time since George III was on the throne of England 
that a non-English speaking, non-Western, non-democratic state would be the largest economy in the world. That is what I call systemic and structural change. So for those reasons, it goes beyond the normal pay grade of the good chaps down at the FCO or other unmentionable institutions uh, or uh, their counterparts around the world. There's one further problem too, on the Chinese side of the equation, um, because of the nature of the one party state, um, the party itself, as opposed to the foreign ministry professional class, are those who are making these big calls on deep systemic and structural questions. And in doing so, the Chinese system is drawing upon and led by Xi Jinping, an ideological framework of analysis anchored in the principles of Marxism Leninism to both interpret reality and to respond to it. If you read carefully Xi Jinping's internal literature uh, on how he views the challenges at home and abroad for the Chinese Communist Party, these are expressed in terms of dialectic materialism and historical materialism. We in the collective West would say, that sounds quaint, that sounds antiquated, that sounds like something that happened in a bad James Bond movie made before 1991. But the bottom line is, it is the intellectual and analytical software of the Chinese Communist Party. Bian Zheng Fa, Wu Wei Bian Zheng Fa, as well as um, uh, historical materialism, Li Shi Shi, and Wei Wu Shu Yi, and so these and Ma Dun Lun, the theory of contradictions, Dou Zheng Lun, the theory of struggle. These are not secrets to those of us in the West because we read all your stuff, okay? Because it's out there in the public literature, it's in the ideological literature. So the reason I say that is that the party itself is a very deep analytical framework for analyzing, comprehending, and responding to deep structural change. So therefore, us to simply strategically mirror image and assume that our Chinese friends would behave as the way in which, quote, we, that is, the West would behave, is on itself flawed as well. That's why we are at one of those inflection points in the world where it is in its own way, another Mao, Nixon, Kissinger moment, either ignored or taken or let drift to become its own new reality. Uh, and therefore that requires the engagement of the principles. So the purpose of this book is simply to alert people to, I think that's what's happening. And secondly, don't get caught by surprise if the structural nature of what's unfolding rapidly catapults through a single incident into crisis, escalation, conflict, and war. Okay, can I just then pick up a question from that some of the diplomatic side, now the political side, are you the prime minister? The Australian prime minister has just taken office uh, the UK's Prime Minister struggled with his own party and other issues. Mr. Macron just lost, you know, spending lots of time trying to get struck the parliamentary majority there. American governments, you know, always thinking about the next election it could be very difficult. How do you think, I mean, who is it in the foreign affairs ministries of these countries and others? Do you think you're going to be able to get this message across to you so that the heads of government act in a way that you think is essential in their best interest? As I answer that question, we should also reflect on the fact that in the Chinese system, there is an equal preoccupation with domestic politics. It's simply conducted in the Chinese Communist Party. It's factional. It's intense. It's competitive. Um, it's not articulated as such. But beneath the surface, as we rocket our way towards the 20th Party Congress, let me tell you, it's sharp uh, and it's highly competitive. So therefore, both systems in their own different ways are contending with uh, the domestic struggle for power, if you like. And the only advantage of the Western system, as I would argue it, is that uh, we have automatic stabilizers, something called elections. Uh, in the Chinese system and in authoritarian systems, you don't. You have good emperor syndrome and you can have bad emperor syndrome in the Chinese tradition. So who therefore within systems can be seized of, let's call it deep structural change in the overall international order and what therefore is required to be done about it. 
Uh, reflecting on the American system, uh, the minds at work currently in the National Security Council under President Biden, led by National Security Advisor uh, Jake Sullivan, are intensely aware of where they sit in the historical process now. I cannot give you advice in terms of how effectively that's been articulated into the arms of US policy yet, uh, but this process is underway. Um, secondly, in the Chinese system, if I look carefully at uh, those in the system under Xi Jinping, who are analysing the pace and rate of change in the structure, as reflected in the ideological phrases they use in their internal discourse, change is not yet seen in 100 years. Um, uh, China moving to the centre of the global stage. Uh, progress in the great uh, renaissance of the Chinese nation. Uh, the uh, uh, comprehensive national power. The fact that uh, the world is becoming irreversibly multipolar. These are all, this is all code language for the structure is deeply changing and summarized in Xi Jinping's phrase of Dong Sheng Xi Jiang. Um, the rise of the East and the decline of the West. So the systems, in their own way, uh, in the manner in which I just sought to describe, are aware that of the, let's call it the diagnostics. What we do not yet have uh, beyond the diagnostics is the prescription. Last time this happened in the world system was the remarkable peaceful implosion of the uh, Soviet Union in 1991. And prior to that, it was the defeat of Nazi Germany in 45 and the collapse of imperial Japan. After the 45 set of events, the person who analysed and conceived the response to the collective West was George Kennan and the uh, strategic doctrine of containment against the Soviet Union. Uh, after the collapse of uh, the Soviet Union in 1991, there was no parallel exercise of intellectual effort in order to how best to sustain the post-Cold War order. Hence, the I think the monumental uh, mistake of the United States in its political and strategic indifference to assisting the then Russian Federation in that critical decade following the collapse of the CPSU. And that, I think, has generated its own subsequent reality. So we're probably at the third such juncture, but the minds are at work on it. But I don't think they've reached consensus yet on the prescription as opposed to the diagnostics. Okay, very good. Now I'm going to turn to the audience. This event is being recorded, so it will be broadcast as a podcast afterwards. Oh my God. Oh, too, too late now. I, should have said this I always forget to say these things. <laughs> um, I've got some questions here coming in. Um, please send more in if you're watching online. Who would like to ask a nice, sharp, short, sharp question? Gentlemen, there's a microphone coming towards you, so wait for that because it'll be picked up online. Hi, thank you very much uh, for, for the Feel sharing. To say who you are, uh, I'd like to say who you are. I'm Sean. I'm a first year student doing international relations and history. Um, you talked about uh, managed strategic competition, but isn't that inherently based on the assumption of the willingness of each of the parties of uh, or actually like um, agreeing to rules and agreeing to a certain set of orders? So isn't that that's not really different from the idealistic assumption of peace and order? So like inherently how how are we going to make these great powers um get to the table and actually set a set of rules you know to manage these strategic competitions that's my question thank you that's a great question um the premise of the book uh is, and the argument is pretty simple and that is that um right now uh neither of the countries or systems trust each other neither of them have any level of strategic trust towards the other speak to your average um three or four star from the People's Liberation Army, they are as trustful of the United States as their counterparts are in the US military. That is zero. Um, therefore, um, this is not an argument constructed on the basis of any level of strategic trust, but it's based on an argument which says there is sufficient strategic self-interest on the part of each party not to have an accidental war this decade because neither side of the stage is ready. However, the risk of accidental war is great of the type I described before. 
For example, let me tell you what could happen. If the Republicans come back the next election under, for example, a Pompeo type figure, or Pompeo was Secretary of State next time round, and the Republican Party incrementally moves towards the recognition of Taiwan as an effectively independent state, then suddenly, even though the PRC and the PLA are not yet strategically ready for such a war, the internal ideological imperatives, almost of a theological nature within the Chinese Communist Party, would force it to go into armed conflict. That's the nature of the beast. Therefore, um, the thing about managed strategic competition is that it recognizes that there are certain things which can be avoided in order to reduce the risk of accidental crisis, conflict, escalation, and war. One of them I outline in the book is for the American body politic to fall short of ever doing any such thing. Uh, that is moving in the direction of Heidel, um, which is incrementally crab walking its way towards. That's dangerous. There's another set of proposed uh, arguments about uh, this uh, increasingly uh, aggressive set of deployments by the Chinese PLA Air Force PLAF, as we name it in the business, um, in its uh, deployments into the Taiwanese Air Defense Administration zone. So it's about sufficient strategic interest on both sides to reduce the risk of accidental crisis and conflict and war for the period ahead. The weakness of my argument is this, being scholarly about it, um, political class which taught never to admit weakness, but let me go to the weakness of my argument, uh, is that it is often said this argument of mine is about kicking the can down the road that ultimately you're simply postponing the inevitable. To which my answer is, yes, unapologetically so. I'm heavily into can kicking down the road because the idea of conflict tomorrow to quote, clean it all up, 1914, is so inherently abhorrent uh, that all those cans should be kicked down the road as long as possible. That's my argument. The second is this, in the course of the next decade, it may just be that the United States and the Taiwanese rebuild sufficient military deterrence nationally and on Taiwan to cause the PLA, by the time we get to the early 30s, to say to Xi Jinping, because he will still want to be in office then, that Comrade Chair, we love Xi, we love Ling, we love Ling Xiu, we love Tong Shui, all the honorifics usually used to describe Xi Jinping. Um, it's still too risky, Comrade. Now, you might then say, in the weakness of the argument, so why would the Chinese accept managed strategic competition now? Well, there's another reason they don't want to pull the lever now because China at this stage is economically unprepared. It believes that it is still vulnerable now, and it is because it's dependent on the international dollar-denominated financial system as of today. By decade's end, that may not be the case as China seeks to remove itself from SWIFT and, and enter into a different system, system in terms of international uh, capital markets. But by that stage, if the Americans have played the game effectively and done something to reboost deterrence over Taiwan and through uh, and in Taiwan and through its own military forces, that we may get to a stage by that stage where again the military is saying too risky, comrade chair, even though you are now financially and economically sufficient resilient to do it. So the reason I'm putting this in stark terms to you is there is some method in my madness. Uh, by time now, enhanced deterrence later on, so that if, when push comes to shove, it's still too much of a risk to do it. My argument is we should, as Deng Xiaoping originally told us, allow future generations to resolve this fraught question of Taiwan's future, rather than assume that this generation has the wisdom to do so. Okay, I'll come to, I want to ask one question because it's sort of related. I'll come to you next. This is an online question from Adam Yang, previous student from UCL, currently working in London in the finance industry. And the question is, considering US and Chinese economies have connected deeply during the globalization of the past decade, probably longer, if the US and China started a war, the US economy might have short-term catastrophic results such as inflation and supply chain blockage, which would hurt the 
support for the US president. Does this mean the US would be reluctant to have a full blown war with China? I suppose that question also could be seen the other way around, given China's dependent on, dependence on exporting to the West. Um, there is a lot of logic in the question which has just been asked by um, Andrew. Is it Andrew yet? Adam. Adam, yeah. And, um, and it is a reason why structurally, both sides being cognizant of that risk, they're now embracing selective forms of economic decoupling from each other in order to make that risk more manageable uh, in the future. You see this most spectacularly in the area of semiconductors, which are frankly the, um, the holy grail of the rest of the um, uh, giant competition and technology between the two sides. If you control the future of semiconductors, you control the future of artificial intelligence, you control the future of, frankly, most other domains of, uh, of technology. It's the engine room of who wins the great race of technology. The Chinese know that. Americans know that. That's why they're seeking to decouple in this domain at present in order to be sufficiently self-reliant so that the systems don't collapse. But of course, it's not the only area. Capital markets right now are massively intertwined US and Chinese capital markets today, $5 trillion worth of activity. Put that into context, one third of Chinese GDP equivalent. It's a lot of cash. One quarter of American GDP equivalent, that's a lot of cash. To simply unscramble that omelet overnight, uh, frankly, is mind boggling. That's why there's no resolution at present in either Washington or Beijing as to the wisdom of doing it or how in fact to do it just now. And it wouldn't exist even as a conceptual possibility so long as China is a part of SWIFT, that is the international dollar denominated clearance system, the international financial system. How would the Chinese get around that? They would have to uh, open their uh, capital account, float the renminbi, establish an alternative uh, SWIFT clearance system around the world. Why won't the Chinese do that? because they're worried about external manipulation of uh, the renminbi on international currency markets by malevolent foreign, that is Western, that is American sources. Therefore, it's complex, but to answer his question, uh, yes, right now, the damage to both countries' economies would be formidable and comprehensive, and both sides are now seeking to reduce that level of prospective damage while recognizing at present they can never eliminate it. Hi, uh, thanks for the speech and congratulations on the book. Um, I'm Alex, I, I graduated from LSE a couple of years ago and I'm now a corporate lawyer. Uh, but before I sold my soul... Are you having fun? Yes, a <laughs> lot. How uh, um, much did you sell your soul for? <laughs> not enough. In the papers all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. Uh, before I sold my soul though, I, I, um, I studied philosophy and public policy here and I... Uh, I did an internship, uh, despite my accent, I am actually Australian originally. Uh, I did an internship with the Australian Permanent Mission to the United Nations. And uh, towards the end of the internship, they asked, do you want to give a speech on Russia and Ukraine and being half Russian? I, I said, yeah, I'd love to. So you're a half Russian Australian living in London? Yeah, yeah, all messed up. And you sold yourself. Yeah, exactly. You um, uh, uh, I gave the speech and it was, uh, this was when we knew Russia was in Ukraine already, in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, and the speech consisted of, we are very concerned about this, uh, but we're not going to say anything else. Goodbye. The question for you is, um, how much do neutral countries and countries, you know, broadly with their heads screwed on properly uh, that care about human rights have to sacrifice economic rights to make a moral argument against China? And how likely is it that they will do so? Well, I think our best case study of that so far is the Ukraine, where A, the collective West assumed that uh, Ukraine fold in a week. Uh, it didn't, because guess what? peoples are predisposed to fight hard for their national freedom. And secondly, uh, given the nature of the Russian system on display internally, uh, they are predisposed almost as much to fight for their local and individual freedoms. 
Uh, what has truly shocked uh, Putin and his inner circle is the extent to which the Ukrainians did that. My day. What shocked them even more was the um, what they generally assume as a bowl of strategic marshmallow, that is the European Union, um, actually had coherence on this question. And after the Europeans looked and said, by God, the Ukrainians didn't fall within a week, um, then we have no moral alternative moral alternative um, other than to stand with them despite the economic threat now being executed on energy supplies uh, out of Russia um, as well as the general damage to the global economy occasioned by the inflationary, inflationary forces that have now been unleashed. So as a very recent and contemporary case study my answer to your question is quite a lot and more I think than the uber nationalists perhaps in either uh, Moscow or Beijing assumed, or even those in Brussels assumed before this thing began. Right, okay, I'm gonna take a relate, um, couple of questions, be ready everybody else to come back. A uh, couple of questions here online. One from Sean Wrigley in Perth, Australia. Doing the LSE in September. How prepared does Australia for the Perth, for God's sake? It should be in bed. Anyway, it's going to be now a party yeah. on Friday night. How prepared is Australia <laughs> for potential conflict with China? And if America is unable to guarantee Indo Pacific security in such a scenario, what's Australia's odds of managing on its own? And related to that, a question from Anthony and LSE External Lung. What options should middle powers like Australia and New Zealand consider? In your three principles of this strategic competition but these are related questions i think for a country like uh, oz um uh, which is 25 million people on a piece of real estate the size of the united states with a coastline which is i think the fourth longest in the world it's a bit tricky um, so we discovered that in the second world war um when there were even less of us uh, and there was something called the imperial japanese army uh, and navy bearing down upon us. I always remind our Chinese friends, why are we allies of the United States? To protect us from Japan, if that happens to ring the historical bell for our Chinese friends. So therefore, for a country like Australia, it actually makes a lot of national um, good sense to be uh, a firm ally of a superpower with whom you share values and interests to assist in the long-term national security guarantees of such a vast piece of real estate, which is Australia. Um, uh, and I know from uh, the studies uh, undertaken decades ago in Australia, that it was when the analysis was done as to who could successfully territorially assault Commonwealth of Australia um, by the end of the last century, there's only one country, and that was the United States, with the capability of doing it. And so um, it is a massive undertaking uh, to threaten the territorial integrity, less so the political sovereignty of a country like Australia. So therefore, it does make axiomatic sense for us to be, remain allies of the United States. When asked this question by various Chinese leaders over the years, as I have been, uh, I've answered in the same terms. And they look at me and say, that makes sense. <laughs> of course, they won't say that publicly uh, because it's uh, about the perfidious Cold War legacy of America's alliance structures. But when I said, what would you do if you were us? They sort of nod and then go back to eating their bowl or whatever. Um, and the other part of the question was, what do middle powers do more generally within a framework of managed strategic competition? Uh, it's a question I've been chatting to um, various Brits about today, and what can Europeans do about this question as well? I think there's uh, a core uh, responsibility for all of us, given where we are, and given the enormous polarizing nature of a war in the Taiwan Straits tomorrow, if one was to occur because of a triggering incident like a Sarajevo type incident then I think it behoves all of us as middle powers and smaller powers and great powers uh, to engage both the Chinese and the Americans on this single question. It is in our global interest for you to stabilize this relationship now. 
Uh, we're not saying right or wrong. We will all have our separate views on this. But as a matter of geostrategic stability, a de minima set of proposals like this from this very nice book, which you could all buy outside. <laughs> the um, I'm still in retail. The uh, uh, is reducing the risk of accidental conflict is actually a global need because the cost to the rest of us of a Russia-Ukraine war on speed, which is what it would be if it was a China-US war over Taiwan, um, is such that achieving such a de minima set of rules of the road now is a global need for us all. So middle powers and other powers, I think, have uh, a responsibility to put that view both to Beijing and Washington. Okay. Another question in the room. Yes, and then one there, one here. Who was the lowest question? Female question at some point. If we can. Thank you so much. Have you as well. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned early on in your book uh, the problem of a language deficit in U.S.-China relations. The fact that so few Americans speak and understand Chinese compared to their counterparts, uh, and the same problem exists in the U.K. What's the solution there, and and what approach should we take to Confucius Institutes, which, for all their faults, are, are the driving force of Chinese language learning in most countries? There's a big controversy about this, pressed by British parliamentarians. <laughs> yeah, um, my argument is that in the book is that the Chinese political system places an enormous emphasis on understanding what's going on. Uh, in the United States. Uh, there are multiple institutes uh, in Beijing whose principal function is to analyze America from the inside out. Uh, they don't always get it right, but let me tell you, there's a huge amount of effort. And to work in those institutes, by and large, you need to be fully fluent uh, in English and American English at that. There is very little parallel effort uh, that I observe in the United States. Um, it's not so much whether individual political leaders speak the language or not. Xi Jinping doesn't speak English. Um, and uh, I wouldn't expect American presidents to be able to speak Chinese. I think it's useful that they have a passing familiarity with the uh, nature of the political culture, uh, the system, how the Communist Party works. Whereas at present, these are just things seen as blocks of activity, okay, as opposed to understanding the internal texture of that activity. Um, the, the example was given before about the Cuban Missile Crisis. If you've read Graham Allison's book, Essence of Decision, which is about uh, the decision-making processes within uh, Washington uh, during <clears throat> that crisis, uh, the fact that there was no real parallel attempt to understand the structure of Soviet decision-making, other than the two Kennedy brothers at home at night, working out whether Khrushchev would actually do it and um, how that decision would be taken between he and his colleagues. So therefore, for those sorts of reasons, it's really important that, if not the language, that it is made to understand the complexity of the systems and actually the, the production process involved in making the strategic decision of that nature. In the case of China, it is very much the internal decision-making process of the Central Military Commission and the the Jiu-Jitsu the Jiu and the Changwe, the Politburo and the Standing Committee. They are three relevant institutions and the institutional relationship between the three of them and what actually would be a group of more than about 30 people, but each of them would have a critical role in that decision, as opposed to the blob or the block, which equals China. Okay. Uh, the Chinese, by contrast, have an active sense of how the National Security Council works. They understand the internal decision-making processes. There's a lot of literature on it. The Chinese studied intently. Okay, I will take one. I will take this question, perhaps one more. Has anybody else got a question? Finish it. Okay, behind you. Okay. Thank you for your speech. And uh, my question is this. So very recently, uh, the Foreign Office, uh, the Foreign Secretary of China, Wang Yi, paid a visit to the Pacific countries, the islands, what we call the uh, 
太平洋八国 ，so the eight countries that are Pacific. So, what do you think that he succeeded in signing treaties? He failed in some of them. He succeeded in, I think, three or four of them. But what do you think that means to、um, U.S. and China relations? And what do you think that the Asia Pacific plays a role、uh, in the China? U.S. relations, and we can extend this to、um, the Dongmeng,、uh, uh, the the、uh, Indonesia, Malaysia, the countries that have that yield less influence in the uh, uh, global uh, realm. What what roles do they play, and how can they be a leverage to the managed strategic comp competition? First thing to say in response to your question is that. Uh, Wang Yi's、uh, visit to the Taiping Shadow,、um, the small countries, of the island countries of the South Pacific,、um, is that it reflects the global nature of the strategic competition that I referred to at the very beginning. Why else would you be there? Why else would you, if you were China, be so active in port construction at the moment in Cambodia? Why are you、uh, laying out a series of ports across the so-called string of pearls, reaching from Bangladesh through Sri Lanka into、uh, Pakistan onto the Iranian coast?、Uh, why have you taken a 1990-year lease for a、uh, PLA naval base in Djibouti? Why are you seeking to do the same both on in Tanzania or possibly Kenya in the Indian Ocean facing African states, and now、uh, on the west coast of the African Peninsula as well? Unless It's a global competition, which it is. So, the first point I make is an empirical one. China does not do these things for fun. It does it for real competitive reasons. PLA will justify this because you've got Chinese peoples living across Africa, across the rest of the world. You have instability. China needs to have national means to evacuate. Well,、um, that is、uh, an answer up to a point. But as we all know, I should be jabbed in Kajiako. Um, it's just a, it's a good excuse. So that's the first thing. The second is in the case of the Pacific Island states, I think particularly the Chinese interest is twofold. One, they lie at the centre of the、um, sea lines of communication between Australia and Japan, and Australia and the Republic of Korea.、Uh, and for those reasons, in the event of a crisis, oh by the way, and sea lines of communication between Australia and certain Australian ports in China itself. So, for those reasons, and particularly when you look at Melanesia and the Solomons,、uh, the capacity to interdict slots, sea lines of communication, is augmented if you actually have a capability uh, to uh, leverage from in the region. The third is submarine、um, telecommunications cables、uh, between Australia and the United States all go through there. And so,、uh, the PLA doesn't do things for fun.、Uh, that's what the PLA is on about. It's a highly competitive race. What can the island states do? The island states are quite interesting in response to one a one year eight nation tour.、Uh, they basically rejected the idea of a、um, security agreement between China and those states. I suspect that the reason Wang Yi did it when he did it three days after the Australian election,、uh, the election of a new Australian Labor government, quite round of applause for the government. My team.、Oh, sorry. The、uh, was out there campaigning for six weeks to get rid of the previous government, but、um, uh, was that the response uh, was, uh, I think, from China that they recognised that Australian Labor governments are historically deeply sensitive to the island states. We listen carefully. We are long-term development partners of them. We represent their climate change interests in the world big time,、um, and、uh, by instinct and history. Quite close to them, China, I think, overreached and thought that through this visit they could, as it were,、um, scoop up the interests of these island states prior to the new Australian government effectively taking office. It didn't work, so、um, I think China will reflect on that for the future. Final point on Southeast Asia: in the geopolitics of wider Asia, Southeast Asia remains the swing state. Between the United States and China in the geopolitics of wider Asia and the Indo-Pacific, countries of Southeast Asia, or ten of them, would ultimately prefer a situation where they could just be left alone to manage their independence from China, sustain their security, 
both among each other uh, and frankly against the rest of uh, the region and the world and continuing the path of economic development without having to choose. Uh, at present, on balance, my judgment is that China is winning the geostrategic race in Southeast Asia because the economic footprint is so pronounced and the relative American economic footprint is of declining significance until the Americans overcome their neuralgia towards free trade uh, driven by both Republicans and Democrats in the United States Congress and re-embrace something like the Trans-Pacific Partnership and open their markets and those of the NAFTA economies to all the economies of Southeast Asia, then China could well prevail. We need to finish in a moment. I promise you can make the shortest version of your question you could and the shortest version of an answer you can make. And like I say, it's just sure. impossible. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I'd try. Thanks. I'll be very quick. Uh, Thank you for a great talk. I'm Philip. I'm one of those British diplomats that you were talking about uh, earlier. Um, uh, and so I, I agree that getting good quality information and engagement with China is very difficult. Um, but to turn that around, uh, the Chinese system, as you talked about, uh, it's a very small group of people that's often getting politically filtered information. Um, what's your advice for how we should engage uh, those types of decision makers? Thanks. You mean uh, as governments or as the academy or as whom? Uh, any way you like. I mean, uh, governments, let's say. The worst thing we can do right now, given where things are in the, let's call it the increasingly polarised US-Chinese world of the uh, third decade of the 21st century, the worst thing we can all do is start pulling down our shutters towards each other. Because there are multiple lines of communication which, in fact, in one form or another are useful. Um, one of the American problems in its non-comprehension of China and the Chinese Communist Party is the assumption that the Chinese Communist Party is one giant monolith with one single view on everything. That is not the case. It is a highly factionalized entity with a whole range of internal interests and a whole range of views, both domestically and internationally. Ultimately, under the supreme leadership of Xi Jinping, which he exercises with an iron fist. But beneath that iron fist, let me tell you, there's a whole range of different views. Therefore, if my analysis is correct, then it is important for all of us to continue to engage the totality of the Chinese system, um, including those views which would be supportive of Xi Jinping or opposed to Xi Jinping or neutral towards Xi Jinping's worldview. And they all exist within a Communist Party of 92 million members, marginally larger than the population of the United Kingdom. So I therefore argue that to sustain uh, that level of engagement at the academic level, at the think tank level, at the officials level, and the people to people level, continues to be important. The final point I'd say is the worst thing we do is pull down the shutters. Then it is much easier for rancid nationalism to work more effectively as a poison in both countries' political cultures, so that when crisis um, arises over an incident and where escalation is unfolding, it is the nationalist rah-rah which takes over, as opposed to reasoned voices elsewhere in the polities of both countries saying, is this wise? And it was nationalist rah-rah which prevailed over common sense in 1914. Okay, we shall end as we began. Uh, it's spared, you'll be spared me asking the question which I would have asked at the end, one at a time, which is, had a book of this kind be written, be written by you or somebody else some years ago about the US and the West's relationship with Russia? Might we have been in a different position today, but I won't ask that. It's a different question for a different event. Uh, I'd like to thank Kevin Rudd enormously. Before you give a round of applause, I want to check is the book signing going on out there in here? Okay, so we, we right, you stay yeah, where you are. Uh, You'll bring the book. I'm selling the book out there and so Kevin's signing it in, in here. Yeah. Wonderful. All right, so the book will be outside, the signer, the author will be inside. Gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank Kevin Rudd.